Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is uh, a reading week uh, wrap up which is just going to focus on one book. This is Elizabeth Costello by J.M. Kotsia, a South African writer who I think is regarded as one of the most important contemporary writers uh, of our time. And this is the second Kotsia book I've read. I read his book Disgust and I can't actually remember anything about it. So I came to this with interest really. Um, one of those situations where I feel it's make or break with an author for me and having read it even though it's a really worthwhile read a provocative read in many ways I don't think he's an author for me uh, I would give this three and a half stars out of five um, mainly uh, for reasons obviously which I'll dig into in greater detail but mainly because I didn't like his shtick I didn't like the game he was playing with us, or I believe that he was playing with us. Anyway, Elizabeth Costello is a writer from Australia, age 67, a fictional writer, age 67. Seems like all her best work is behind her. And all of the chapters in here are her going to uh, places outside of Australia on you know, to, to receive an academic award or to take part in a conference. Uh, she visits her sister who has set up a, who's a nun, who has set up a, an AIDS hospital in uh, KwaZulu in South Africa. So all these different places and each of them involves a lecture, for want of a better word. Um, if you actually look at the inside cover, it says Elizabeth Costello, Eight Lessons. And unlike Victor Pelevin in uh, Empire Five, uh, and unlike Stanislaw Lem in His Master's Voice, Kurtzy here doesn't really disguise the fact that he's just lecturing at you. Uh, it is slightly different in that you have to all the time wonder how much does Elizabeth Costello represent what Kurtzy himself believes. Um, again, we'll get into that in, in detail. Now, normally, when, when an author is lecturing me, even um in an artful way like it is here uh i don't like you know i don't like um being lectured at i you know i like uh literary and artistic writing now, there's lots of literary ideas in here and there's some fine writing some fine stylistic writing but at the end of the day it is still lectures and as i say unadorned i mean curtsy doesn't even try and, and uh, disguise them so that's one strike against the book uh, and it's, you know, I showed you that thing saying eight lessons. And <laughs> what is quite nice, I guess, is that the lessons are for Elizabeth Costello to learn, you know, rather than lessons that she's handing out. She's giving these speeches and talks and everything. But each one leads to her next encounter where she's had to roll back from the previous speech. So, for example... She gives a, a lecture on sort of animal rights, comparing uh, the meat industry with the Holocaust and the Second World War. And uh, accordingly, she uh, gets uh, accused of anti-Semitism. Um, and to make up for this, she feels that she has to participate in a conference on the nature of evil. Um, so each time she's had to roll back her own ideas, it's almost that her ideas are wrong or they're more nuanced than she had allowed for. There's also, the, the lectures are sort of delivered in, in a knowing way, as sort of, this is playing the game, this is doing the circuit, this is what a writer needs to do. The real, the real artistry is in the writing of the book. This is just sort of showmanship, promotion, all that sort of thing. So those two twin tracks rather undermine Costello's status within the book as an authority. And this is one of the problems I have with the book, that does Elizabeth Costello represent J.M. Kurtzia? Because if she does, he doesn't seem to like her very much. And that, I think, undermines us in what we think of Kurtzia and his ideas. As I said, the ideas in here are very interesting, but the, the authority behind them is unravelled because each time Elizabeth Costello has to retrench and, and retreat from those ideas and not stand by them. And this relationship between her, or uh, well, the presumed relationship between, you know, her as a mouthpiece for Kurtzia. So, for example, Kurtzia, a male writer, has chosen to explore these ideas, which one has to assume play in his mind. 
uh, through the guise of a female author, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, except there's a couple of instances of female sexuality and violence against women where they read as male fantasies um, and not that authentic uh, as if, if a woman might have, have portrayed them. So again, that undermines the authority, not in this case of Elizabeth Costello, but of J.M. Kurtzia. So, for example, um, there's a flashback where um, Elizabeth is, is sort of back to her early 40s. Her mother's her husband has died or, or he's not in the picture anyway. And she hooks up, the mother, this is, hooks up with a gentleman friend. Um, he gets ill himself and, and seems to be losing his sort of his, his powers, his puissance. But one of the things he does is he paints and um, Elizabeth um, models for him, fully clothed. And in the nature of the, these sittings, she feels sorry for him for his declining powers. And she decides that, she, you know, uh, an offhand remark he makes about painting nudes. She decides to model for him nude and in the middle of a session sort of, you know, lowers her the strap of her dress and exposes her breast. Now, on the one hand, she's very um, empowered by that. You know, she's a 40 year old. She's still quite proud of her body, even though earlier we're told she doesn't, you know, by her own son, we're told that, you know, she's not a woman who particularly glams herself up. Um, so on the one hand, it's empowering for her. But on the other hand, that reads to me like a male fantasy uh, and the apotheosis and consummation of that when um, the, 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 he's not a stepfather, but effectively he's a stepfather, is, is in his at his deathbed. And there's an act there, a sort of continuation or a, the next stage of what she did for him in modelling nude uh, as a kind of a last thrill, a last sort of assertion of his bodliness, which read as complete male fantasy to me. So that was really unsatisfactory. And in another chapter, which is you know, consideration on the nature of evil, um, again, she has a flashback to when she's in her 20s and she uh, hooks up with this sort of bit of rough trade, a working class docker in Australia. And they go back to his room and what's, you know, he, he gets a bit fresh with her. She decides she doesn't want to have sex with him, having gone there with the assumption of this is a middle class rebellion on her part by hooking up with a working class guy uh, that provokes his male violence his sort of chauvinistic violence and it turns from wanting sex to to uh, him basically uh, physically abusing her and again it's it's an easy trope for a male writer to ascribe that to a female and I'm not saying it doesn't happen of course it happens but it just didn't read authentic as if a woman had written it or a different male author I think I might have believed it better. And also what it comes across is that, yes, it's a male being violent to a woman, but it's also a, a sort of a, a class thing that this working class guy, you know, can't express himself in any other way except through violence. So I thought that was very sort of stereotypical and, and unsatisfactory. So this this whole time, the relationship between Kurtz expressing himself through a female author just didn't wash with me. Now, that's not to say there weren't points in which, you know, she's 67. You know, the way it read was that she was at herself almost at death door, you know, on the way out of life, you know, in her 80s or whatever. But within that, there were some poignant bits of writing about her sort of frailty and what she can no longer do and all that sort of stuff. So it's not entirely without merit. It's not entirely without empathy. But when when it's just descriptions like that, it works. It's when he's trying to sort of ratchet in what he wants to say you know the ideas he wants to get over in this book I think he falls short and I, th I think his choice of making it a female author to express clearly the doubts he himself has had through his writing or, or you know at this point in his writing career about the nature of writing and ideas and all of that which is the final bit of what I'm going to talk about so they're his doubts his self-doubts and ambiguities he is transposed onto a female author but I think it would have better served him to have been a, a male author. But anyway, so on, on to the ideas. So the first chapter is called Realism, where she's been awarded 
uh, an a prize by an academic institution in uh, in America. Fifty thousand dollars, and she goes there to receive it. And her son sort of chaperones her around because he's a bit worried and, and wants to protect her from it all being a bit too much. Because it's a transatlantic journey, and she's tired, and she's only there for two or three days, and lots of people want a piece of her and talk to her and stuff. Um, and the the acceptance speech she gives on a pre arranged, pre agreed subject is on realism. But the speech she gives has nothing to do with realism because it's about Kafka's short story called Report to an Academy, in which, if you don't know, basically uh, an ape has been civilised by man and, you know, wears clothes, has learned to speak, presumably German since Kafka wrote it, and is delivering a lecture on his findings on the relationship he finds himself as an ape in human society. So, first of all, it's typically... Uh, allegorical from Kafka. Second of all, it can be accused of anthropomorphism, although in a way, Kafka's reversed the, the lens. Um, you know, this is a report on human behaviour uh, to, in the eyes of an uh, animal species. Um, so it has very little to do with realism. And the argument within by Elizabeth Costello's lecture is that we can no longer trust the words on a page. You know, when an author used to describe a glass of water sitting on a table, you knew that's what you were talking about, whereas this, this ape addressing a thing, you no longer know where you stand. You know, are we supposed to read it literally that an ape is literally addressing a human audience, or is it some sort of, you know, uh, parable about alienness? Um, how how you know someone who's so alienated might appear to their fellow man, whether anything but fellow man. Um, so that's all quite unsatisfactory, really. Um, and yet that chapter started in a really interesting way because the son is the narrator of it and he's he's basically sort of telling you know the events of her stay in in America uh, but curtsy is quite sort of artful and you know playing around with the sort of notion of fiction uh, the presentation scene itself we skip it is not a good idea to interrupt the narrative too often since storytelling works by lulling the reader or listener into a dreamlike state in which the time and space of the real world fade away, superseded by the time and space of the fiction. Breaking into the dream draws attention to the constructiveness of the story and plays havoc with the realist illusion. However, unless certain scenes are skipped over, we will be here all afternoon. The skips are not part of the text, they are part of the performance. So, you know, when he's sort of been quite sort of almost metatextual. That's quite interesting, but this is the only chapter in which that happens. This is the only chapter in which we're really talking about realism. Um, so that was the first chapter. The second chapter, she's paid a lot of money to go and deliver um, a, speak, uh, a talk on a cruise ship. And uh, she delivers her sort of, as I said, you know, fairly, you know, uninvolving prosaic speech you know she's not a great deliverer of, of, of talks and speeches she herself knows the arguments inside out has given this speech a hundred times before so she's not particularly inspired or inspiring but the guy another guy who's who's been uh, contracted to deliver a talk is an african writer and she they've met before as you know writers bump into each other appear on panels together and stuff and he gives his talk on African literature being different from um, European literature, because whereas in realism it was a discussion between the idea and idealism versus materialism and realism, here it's slightly shifted to a notion of European writing is bodiless, it is all in the mind, whereas African writing, with its oral tradition, as at source is very much always starts and ends with the body is always embodied which i think is a very interesting idea and obviously curtsy being from south africa you know he's he's versed in 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 you know the culture cultural tradition of african writing um but she's quite snooty about about this this guy in that she thinks he's a bit of a con man in that he once wrote novels and stuff but hasn't written anything for you know, worthwhile for years, as as interestingly, neither is she. And she accuses him, really, of just doing these gigs, of, of just, you know, doing stuff for money, not being an artist anymore, being a performer, being a showman. Um, and then we go on to chapter three, 
which is The Lives of Animals, uh, part one, The Philosophers and the Animals, and, and lesson four, which is The Lives of Animals, The Poets and the Animals. So this is where her arguments about, um, you know, animals and the Holocaust, um, which get her into hot water uh, in, in an ensuing chapter. But she's, she's sort of arguing about, you know, do I, it's a very... It's a very philosophical and fine-tuned argument about do animals have souls? And it is interesting in and of itself, but it's pure philosophy. It has very little to do with literature unless you're writing uh, anthropomorphically, like Kafka did in, in many ways. But I, you know, I think writing anthropomorphically as an author in fiction is a very limited way to go and has kind of been done to death and, and, and really should, should be abandoned. Because putting human attributes, or at least a human perspective, in the eyes of, of beasts is, I don't think it gets us anywhere. Um, so there are those two chapters. And then we come to the humanities in Africa, where she goes to visit her sister, uh, as I say, who run, who set up an AIDS um, hospital in, in KwaZulu. Uh, this was written in the, in the 90s, where AIDS was still sort of, and still is, I suspect, um, absolutely virulent uh, in Africa and of course Africa unlike the West cannot afford the expensive drugs uh, that people in the West can um, and his sister her sister is a nun and she is fierce you know she is the one who's getting the award not uh, Elizabeth Costello Elizabeth Costello is invited by her sister to come be a witness to it and Costello knows this is the last time they will ever see each other because they're on different continents but they can't help having a fierce set to, a fierce argument, intellectual argument, where the sister is saying basically, she, in her acceptance speech for this award, she's in a, a university and she's denouncing and decrying humanism as having sort of led mankind astray and away from God. Uh, and she's very hard line about this. And she attacks the notion of humanism to a, an audience of humanists. So it seems to run in the family, this sort of confrontational you know, public speaking, even though Elizabeth Costello delivers it in a sort of jaded way, she still manages to sort of, you know, provoke people, uh, hence the anti-Semitism of, of uh, accusation of, of, you know, comparing the Holocaust with, with uh, abattoirs and things like that. Um, so the sister and Elizabeth have this fierce argument about the role of, of religion versus the role of uh, humanism. And the sister, and again, this is very interesting to me. It's not something I'd ever really thought about it because I'm not, you know, within the Christian tradition. But it's, it's sort of, it's sort of saying, well, the only thing that humanists came up with as an alternative to the divine model is is Hellenism. You know, a classical Greek antiquity, which gave us democracy and drama and so many sort of philosophical concepts, but which can't really hold up in a modern world. Therefore, the sister, the nun sister, declares humanism to have absolutely failed. And um, there was the, the riposte to that, uh, that that Elizabeth makes is they get in an argument about um, the nun sister has given a job to uh, a man, a, a native, uh, who was not a very good sort of sculptor. But that's what he does. He carves wood and all he makes is crucifixes and they're in a very sort of primitive style. And... They get in an argument about whether he has genuinely been helped or not, you know, whether he is regarded himself, whether he is, you know, because he's had this sort of constant source of employment, whether he has regarded his life as fulfilled, that he views himself as an artist, when his art hasn't come on at all in the eyes of Elizabeth. It's always the same primitive representations of Christ on the cross. And they have this sort of furious argument. And, and the sister keeps saying, well, why don't you go and ask him if he feels fulfilled? You know, he can no longer carve. You know, he's of an age now where his hands are too gnarled to do it. Go and ask him if he, he thinks he's, you know, wasted his life or, or not progressed or whatever. Or, you know, if religion, his, his sort of dedication to the divine through the simple act of carving, whether that has fulfilled him or not. And Elizabeth never goes and talks to him, despite her sister keep going and saying, go and ask him, go and ask him, go and ask him. So it's... it's it's uh, an argument partly about the authenticity of the African experience uh, through the filter of, of the divine. Of, you know, obviously, uh, 
Christ was a, a Western God brought into Africa um, through missionaries and, and that. Um, so you have on the one hand sort of high civilization, Hellenism uh, versus God and a sort of keeping it real primitivism uh, in a sort of native culture. So that was a very interesting argument to me. I'm not sure what it brought to uh, the overall sort of theme about ideas in writing. Um, and then we come to, I think, the most problematical uh, chapter of them all, which is called The Problem of Evil, where Elizabeth is going to lecture in Amsterdam uh, and she decides to make a lecture around this book by another author that she's read, which is basically uh, fiction treatment of uh, the the uh, Schaftenberg uh, plot to assassinate Hitler, which went, which failed, and uh, all the conspirators were caught uh, and absolutely sort of humiliated before they were hung uh, under Hitler's orders to make it as as sort of humiliating and to punish them as much as possible, and. Uh, in the in the treatment that it gets in this fictional book, uh, the hangman himself basically verbally tortures all of the uh, condemned by sort of telling them what happened, what's going to happen to them, you know, at the end of a rope before they actually die and pass over, uh, you know, all, you know, all the sort of release of the body fluids and the, all this sort of stuff. And she was Elizabeth Costello when she read that was very troubled by that because it is the absolute embodiment of evil and she feels that readers ought to be protected from that and that the journey that the writer the author in in researching and then writing that that stuff which is you know the stuff about the the, the torture is sort of completely made up by the author she thinks he's had to reach so deep into his own soul that it that he has been corrupted by evil uh, just through the process of, of portraying it and she fears that readers will also have their souls corroded by reading it, even though up till then she has been an absolute sort of um, supporter of freedom of expression, that writers can write anything. She suddenly hit a barrier at age 67 where she feels actually perhaps there are no-go areas. So again, it's this sort of retrenchment and retreat from previous bodies of thought that she held. And it's, uh, it so happens that this author is in the audience for her speech, because it's part of a, you know, a week-long conference or whatever. On, on the concept of evil. So she decides, you know, after sort of humming and whoring, once she finds out he's going to be there, what, you know, she just, is she going to rewrite the speech? And she spends all night before the speech trying to rewrite it, can't rewrite it. She sees him in the audience before her speech starts, so she goes and makes an apology in advance before she's delivered it, all these sorts of compromises that she makes, and then she delivers the speech. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that... Um, you know, she particularly focuses on the image of uh, the men vacating their bowels, vacating at, at the end of the rope, and, and you know, basically uh, soiling themselves, soiling their legs. So you get that image, and then in the next chapter, which is a, a musing on the relationship between when you know ancient pagan gods had sex with mortals, and she describes there an angel. Well, not sorry, not an angel, a god, but a god with wings, lying there, um, while a, a more you know having sex with a mortal, uh, and that the you know the, when it's fit when the act of consummation is finished, how the uh, the male um, semen sort of comes back out and sort of flows down the the leg, and it's the absolute inverse really of, of that image in in the evil scene. Uh, in the evil chapter about about sort of bowel vacation so again it's moved on you know to her ideas are sort of out the window really so she keeps giving these provocative speeches you know full of controversial ideas and she keeps having to roll back because she's disproved not so much by what other people are saying but by her own sort of logic as she moves on to the next one it's that aspect is quite interesting, but again, it brings me to the notion that that that, that, that Curtsy doesn't really respect Costello, and therefore, how much status do we ascribe to her to deliver these these ideas? I think Curtsy has wrestled with himself, because we come on to the, the penultimate chapter, um, which is called 
at the gate. And we can only assume that sort of she's died and this is, you know, the, the, the passing over to the afterlife. But she has to go through a gate to go to wherever post-life is. And we get this very sort of sub-Kafka scenario, uh, half the castle, half the trial, where she has to convince a tribunal of judges that she's worthy of passing through the portal to, to the next stage. And what they demand of her is to write a statement of what her beliefs are. And she writes that she has no beliefs because as a writer, she has to, that beliefs get in the way, that beliefs make your work sort of too strident rather than artistic. And that you have to remain open to hearing all sorts of arguments um, which is ironic because, of course, each time that she's nailed down an argument by giving in her previous lecture, um, she sort of limited her own scope. She's nailed her colours to the mast, however prosaically, and then found that, you know, that's not the case or there are other ways of looking at it. So and she sort of describes herself as a writer that, that she's no more than a secretary, that she's invaded by these voices that she's listening out for. And then, and then, she, filled by those voices, she's able to write. But she herself has no beliefs. And the judges challenge her. They go, well, wait a minute. What? And this refers back to the evil chapter. If that's the case, then what happens if a torturer or a killer uh, is the voice that invades you? And she goes, well, I never have. But if they did, that's what I'd write. Um, and she fails. You know, they don't, they, they don't accept that that makes her worthy to pass through to the next. And she has to try again. And she gets some advice from, from someone who's in this sort of strange community who says they're not really interested in what you believe in. What they want to see is passion. You know, is your life filled with passion? So she goes back and she sort of slightly tries to redefine. I don't believe in anything as a constant throughout my life, but I am always filled with passion. And she gives this example, which again refers back in a way to the animal sections of... Um, Frogs who basically go into hibernation in the dry season in Australia, in a dried up river. And when the floods cut, when the rain comes and the river fills and swells and floods, then they come to life again. So she believes in that. And it's a, a statement of materialism. This is a reality. I've observed it with my own eyes. I find this wonderful. This fills me with the joys of life, seeing this process. Um, and that's it. That's the best she can offer as passion, which is very odd, really. Um, and this is where I myself find myself pulling away from Kurtz here. Uh, despite all the interesting thoughts that he's provoked in me as a writer to reflect upon my own sort of what I can feed into all these debates is that, you know, is that the best she can do? You know, I regard myself as a writer of passion, but I have beliefs and inevitably my beliefs appear in my books. So I'm very different from Costello. In that respect, and I suspect that makes me different from Kurt C. I know he's playing devil advocate, devil's advocate to some extent, but it's not a shtick I buy. I think if you if you believe in these things, if you have passions, that ought to feed into your books rather than otherwise it's a dry intellectual moot. All of these lectures are moots because she ends up arguing against herself in the next chapter, um, and I find that very unfulfilling somehow. Um, Yes, if if you're not careful, if you you know you only want to get across your beliefs, your political analysis, or whatever, that can be one sided. So you have to make sure that it's more balanced and more nuanced. Of course, I'm not saying that, but I just didn't I just didn't buy into this 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 thing that that Curtsy did. This whole method just did not work for me. So this again, this is from the penultimate at the gate. I am a writer, a trader in fictions. It says. I maintain beliefs only provisionally. Fixed beliefs would stand in my way. I change beliefs as I change my habitation or my clothes according to my needs. On these grounds, professional, vocational, I, re I request exemption from a rule of which I now hear for the first time, namely that every petitioner at the gate should hold to one or more beliefs. Um, yeah, so really interesting, really, it gets you thinking and that for me makes this a worthwhile read but I fundamentally disagree with it it's, uh, you know when push comes to shove my final verdict on it that's why I give it three and a half um, and I feel like that you know I, I'm very grateful to Brian over at Bookish because I asked him about his thoughts on Kurtzier and he says he feels he Kurtzier does this all the time that he 
he deliberately chooses characters to represent him that are very controversial and different superficially in order for him to push into the dark regions of him his own psyche and the dark regions of mankind that you know it's a book like disgust um you know prompts you know strong reactions and that's fair enough there's nothing wrong with that but uh, you know if these alternative mouthpieces for himself such as elizabeth costello are so flimsy as i feel she is in here so transparently him and yet so um idiotically removed from him and i say idiotically because as i say there are lots of things in here about him writing a woman that just i almost found offensive um and in a way you know she is offensive each time she has to row back it's in reaction to things that have been shown to her that are offensive. You know, she's accused of anti-Semitism. Whether you buy that argument or not, the stuff about the African writer on the cruise ship where she feels that he's lazy and a con man. You know, those are very old tropes about, you know, Africans. And yes, I'm, you know, I'm sure that Curtsy is not saying that's what Africans are like. After all, he is an African himself. But it's offensive. Um... And it's never really countered. Um, although later we, get, you know, we do see uh, where she realizes that the embodied work, which is what the African author was arguing, you know, suddenly she realizes the value of that and what that means uh, as against the work of the the idea of idealism of, of being in the head. But this book doesn't work for me at all. Um, so just going back to, as I say, the, the most interesting chapter for me was the one on, on the nature of evil. And this is what she says. And this, for me, is the clincher of why this doesn't work and why she's a writer or Curtsy's representation of her as a writer. I disagree with 100%. The answer, as far as she can see, is that she no longer believes that storytelling is good in itself. Whereas for West, the guy who wrote the book on evil, or at least for West as he was when he wrote the Stauffenberg book, the question does not seem to arise. If she, as she is nowadays, had to choose between telling a story and doing good, she would rather, she thinks, do good. Wes, she thinks, would rather tell a story. Though perhaps she ought to suspend judgment until she hears it from his own lips. The problem, you know, again, there's a, ro a rollback because the whole point is that in the previous chapter, her sister was doing good by establishing a, a, an AIDS hospital in Africa. And she was, vir Costello was virulently arguing against her on that, saying, you know, you... The problem is, if you reject humanism, you have no role for literature, for words, for ideas. And it's just going, well, I don't really. And in fighting against her sister's philistinism, for want of a better word, she rejects her sister's choice to only do good works, good deeds. And here she's sort of saying, well, now that she's met or read a book by an author that's so horrendous in its portrayal of evil, she now thinks, no, um... If she, as she is nowadays, had to choose between telling a story and doing good, she would rather, she thinks, do good. So, you know, she undermines herself, or um, Curtsy undermines her. Um, and the other annoying thing is, that author, uh, West, is in the, her audience. She confronts him before and after. Before is to apologise, after is to find out what his reaction is and neither time does he speak does he say a word Kurt, now curtsy has made that artistic decision that literary decision that this guy will not speak for himself but that's very frustrating to me as a reader because it's offered that this whole chapter is based upon this guy who wrote the book that i'm criticizing so heavily is in the audience there's so much invested in that you want to know what his reaction to her lecture is you want to know what his reaction to her preemptive apology is and you get nothing. And I find that really unsatisfactory. So all in all, again, to summarise, absolutely worthwhile read, especially if you're interested in some of these themes, these philosophical and literary themes. And at heart, I think it's Curtsy going, he has self-doubts. He's written all the books he's written, but have they really been on point? Have they answered the key questions? Or has he gone off you know, down rabbit holes that perhaps we were asking the wrong questions or gave the wrong answers? And each time he himself has had to roll back. Which is a very interesting concept, but the way it's done through Elizabeth Costello, who is 
a character I put very little merit in. And ultimately, I disagree with her views on literature. It just doesn't work for me. Um, but, you know, as I say, don't let me put you off from reading it because I think I think it's a worthwhile read. There are books that are worthwhile reads, even though they don't work. Um, that book, um, here's another one. Hang on a second. The link to my full review about it, which is about 25, 30 minutes long. It's Quizzic Cadavers by Mina Kandasani. Again, a book that didn't work for me, but was utterly, utterly compulsory reading, I think. Um, in a way that I think this is, but neither of them work. But that doesn't rule them out as being, as I say, worthwhile endeavours to read them. And you may you may disagree. I'd be very interested if there are any Kurtzier fans who can put the counter argument, not necessarily about this book, but about his shtick, about this sort of devil's advocate, about this creating fictional figures that allow him to dig deep into the dark recesses of himself and also the human condition. Um, as I said, there's nothing wrong with that, and I understand the mechanism, but it doesn't work for me in the way that he does it here. So if there are any sort of people who want to defend Curtsy or put the counter ar argument as to what I've been saying as to why it does work, I'd be very grateful because at this point I feel I don't want to read him again. I've seen his shtick. It doesn't work for me. So uh, there you have it. A very, very long and involved discussion, but I think that that speaks to the, you know, the, the provocation of this book, it, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Just ultimately, it didn't succeed for me as a reader. OK, so till next time. Thanks very much.